Lecture 15, The Renaissance. Before we begin studying the next phase in church history, it may be helpful to situate ourselves in history according to the various eras historians often divide history into. The following is but just one such division, and there are many out there. Antiquity can be seen as beginning around 3000 BC and ending in 476 AD when the last Western Roman emperor was deposed and the Western Roman Empire came to a definitive end. 476 to 1453 then can be conveniently be understood as constituting the Middle Ages. The ending year, 1453, is chosen since in this year the city of Constantinople, the eastern capital of the Eastern Empire, fell to the Ottoman Empire. The Renaissance, or rebirth, is often seen as beginning in 1453, as intellectuals fled from the east to the west, bringing their learning with them. The Renaissance can be understood as ending in 1650 with the death of René Descartes, a founder of modern philosophy. Descartes' life and writings helped to give birth to the modern Enlightenment period, which can be considered as lasting from 1650, the year of his birth, and ending in 1789, which coincides with the first year of the French Revolution lasted from 1789 to 1799. The emotionally charged French Revolution gave rise to the Romantic era, with its emphasis on emotion and passion over reason and science. Their era lasted from around 1789 and ended in the mid-1900s. In the early 1900s, a new era coined the Modern Era began. Like the previous Enlightenment era, the Modern Era was characterized by fascination with exact science. During that same century, a new era dawned that is typically called the postmodern era. The postmodern era, influenced by deconstructionism and quantum physics, is skeptical of the exact claim that science and the previous era of modernism previously offered. During this course, the divisions I have made will be flexibly used. Sometimes, certain notable people will be placed within a certain era that, according to the case just given, do not correspond to the specific time the individual lived. This is because these errors are to aid our understanding of history. The people living during these eras were not conscious of our divisions that are to be flexibly understood by seeing a preceding era overlapping with the successor. 1453. The fall of Constantinople and the beginning of the Renaissance. As stated previously, in 1453, the capital city of the Eastern Empire, Constantinople, fell to the Ottoman Empire. Although the fall of the city dealt a devastating blow to the Greek Christians, many were not surprised that the city eventually fell. Prior to the fall, several actions were taken by Greek officials to strengthen their ability to resist the encroaching Ottoman Empire. In 1439, a Bull of Union was signed between the Greek and Catholic churches. Similarly, during the Ecumenical Council of Florence, other testimonies of union were signed between the Greek and Catholic churches. These unions were affirmed by the Greek Emperor Constantine XI, unfortunately. These unions did not last long for a variety of reasons, a principal one being the popular resistance in Greek lands to religious or political unions with the Catholic Church. In 1451, the Greek Emperor Constantine XI appealed to Western Europe, specifically Venice, Ferrara, Rome, and Naples, for help. The subsequent migration of intellectuals from the city to the West helped, along with other factors, to give birth to the Renaissance. During the siege of Constantinople in 1453, Emperor Constantine XI died in battle. His death almost dashed any hope among the Greeks that they would regain their beloved city from the Muslim invaders. Pope Nicholas V, who received Emperor Constantine XI's written plea for help, did try to help, but without much success. In 1452, in the papal bull Dum Diversas, he authorized King Alfonso V of Portugal to go on crusade against the Ottoman Turks. Similarly, in 1455, he 
issued another bull affirming his previous permission to King Alfonso, and I quote from Pope Nicholas V. We therefore, weighing all and singular the premises with due meditation, and noting that since we had formerly, by other letters of ours, granted among other things free and ample faculty the aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed. After Constantinople fell into Muslim hands, it became increasingly more difficult for Europeans to travel to, the, to Asia for spices and other exotic goods desired by their countrymen. Ottomans, the Ottomans did permit travel through their lands, but at a high price. These high fees incentivized Europeans to seek non-land-based routes that would bring them to Asia. As a result, the 1500s, with the, considering the beginning of the Renaissance, is also called the Age of Discovery, as Europeans sought out routes by sea rather than by land to reach the Far East. For Christopher Columbus, this meant sailing west. In contrast, Bartolomeo Diaz attempted to reach Asia by sailing east around Africa. Renaissance Writers the Latin root that the word Renaissance is based on is renascere, renasci, meaning re, again, plus nasci, be born, and what, when put together means, literally, reborn. During this era, scholars revisited their cultural roots by studying ancient manuscripts. Notable writers from around this time include the great poet Dante Alighieri, the humanist Petrarch and his friend Boccaccio, the political philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli, and the saintly statesman St. Thomas More, and the humanist and theologian Erasmus. The poet Dante Alighieri. Although the Italian poet Dante preceded the Renaissance, at least by a common way of dating the Renaissance, he prepared for its rebirth. His most famous work, The Divine Comedy, is called a comedy since it contains the basic comedic form of happy beginning, sorrowful middle, and happy ending. In this case, the happy beginning refers to the original state of nature Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall. The current state we are experiencing on earth is this sorrowful state of the fall. This painful between state precedes the happy heavenly state that we are all called to. We may, though, <coughs> either be detained in purgatory or miss the happy ending of our sad journey altogether in hell. Logically, the Divine Comedy is divided into a section on hell called Inferno, a middle section called Purgatorio, and an ending section Paradiso. Dante's Italian-composed work was so influential that some consider it as a key contributor in the development of Italian as a literary language. For this reason, he is sometimes referred to as the father of the Italian languages. According to Elizabeth K. Haller, Dante has been granted this honorific title since his prose was so catching that it contributed, and I quote her, to the slow demise of Latin as a predominant literary tool. During Dante's time, Latin was the dominant written language. Dante challenged Latin's dominance by transforming Italian into a competing literary language. The humanist Petrarch. Like Dante, the Italian scholar Francisco Petrarch also preceded the dates we have assigned to the Renaissance. Similarly, he prepared the way for the European rebirth. For this reason, he is commonly known as the father of humanism. One way he is humanism's father was his discovering, restoring, and promoting forgotten ancient manuscripts in monastic and cathedral libraries. For example, he restored Livy's history of Rome and made it accessible to other scholars. He also discovered letters by Cicero ad Attica. Along with Livy and Cicero, he promoted the writings of Seneca, Suetonius, to mention but a few classical writers he made known. Perhaps the best way to gain insight into the contag into contagious love of ancient times is found within a description of his life in Letter to Posterity. 
and I'm going to quote from that. I had a well-balanced mind rather than a keen one, one adapted to all kinds of good and wholesome study, but especially inclined to moral philosophy and poetry. In the course of time, I neglected the latter and found pleasure in sacred literature, finding in it a hidden sweetness which I had hither, hit previously taken lightly, and I came to regard the works of poets as mere amenities. Though I was interested in many subjects, I devoted myself especially to the study of antiquity, for I always disliked our own age, so much so that I had, had it not been for the love of those dear to me, I would have preferred to have been born in any other time than our own. In order to forget my own time, I have always tried to place myself mentally in another age. Thus I delighted in history, though I was troubled by the conflicting statements, but when in doubt I accepted what appeared to be most probable or else yielded to the authority of the writer. Petrarch's friend Giovanni Boccaccio A friend and disciple of Petrarch, Giovanni Boccaccio, was an influential poet and writer who, along with Dante and Petrarch, laid the groundwork for the flowering of the Renaissance. He contributed to the development of the Italian language by following Dante's lead in composing his works in Italian. One specific contribution he made was his natural style of dialogue, as particularly evident in his collection of short love stories titled The Decameron. The political scientist Niccoli Niccolo Machiavelli, a Renaissance writer who was markedly different from Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, was Machiavelli. Machiavelli is best known for his political thought, in which he seems to reject rather than promote the concept of justice and virtue by the two notable great thinkers Plato and Aristotle. According to his work, The Prince, dedicated to the Italian Florentine ruler Lorenzo de' Medici, a wise ruler will choose to be immoral when convenient while maintaining an appearance of virtue. His definition of politics as being an amoral realm is evident below. And I quote, I say that every prince must desire to be considered merciful and not cruel. He must, however, take care not to misuse this mercifulness. A prince, therefore, must not mind incurring the charge of cruelty for the purpose of keeping his subjects united and confident. For with a very few examples, he will be more merciful than those who, from excess of tenderness, allow disorders to arise, from whence spring murders and rapine, for these, as a rule, injure the whole community, while the executions carried out by the prince injure only one individual. And of all princes, it is impossible for a new prince to escape the name of cruel, new states being always full of dangers. Nevertheless, he must be cautious in believing and acting, and must not inspire fear of his own accord, and must proceed in a temperate manner with prudence and humanity, so that too much confidence does not render him incautious, and too much diffidence does not render him intolerant. From this arises the question whether it is better to be loved more than feared or feared more than loved. The reply is that one ought to be both feared and loved, but as it is difficult for the two to go together, it is much safer to be feared than loved if one of the two has to be wanting. For it may be said of men in general that they are ungrateful, voluble, dissemblers, anxious to avoid danger, and covetous of gain. As long as you benefit them, they are entirely yours, but they offer you their blood, their goods, their life, and their children. As I have said before, when the necessity is remote, but when it approaches, they revolt. And the prince who has relied solely on their words, without making other preparations, is ruined. For the friendship which is gained by purchase, and not through grandeur and nobility of spirit, is merited, but it is not secured, and at times it is not to be had. And men have less scruple in offending one who makes himself loved than one who makes himself feared. For love is held by a chain of obligation which men being selfish is broken whenever it serves their purpose. But fear is maintained by a dread of punishment which never fails. The saintly statesman St. Thomas More St. Thomas More can be seen almost as a direct antithesis 
of conniving political leaders that Machiavelli extols. Although St. Thomas More is well known for his writings, especially his political satire Utopia, his most important writing is represented by his life as a living scripture. Despite having the high political office of Lord Chancellor, St. Thomas More chose to obey God rather than the laws of England enacted by King Henry VIII. At first, St. Thomas More was a dutiful, obedient subject of Henry VIII. This changed when Henry VIII insisted, without having been granted an annulment by the Pope, on divorcing his wife Catherine of Aragon to marry Anne Boleyn. The king then went one step further by declaring himself head of the Church of England, thus beginning a schism. St. Thomas More heroically refused to recognize the king's invalid marriage and the king's claim to be head of the Church of England. Henry VIII responded by sentencing St. Thomas More to death. St. Thomas More's last words before he was executed are reputed to be, I am the king's good servant, but God's first. In recognition of St. Thomas More's outstanding example for all politicians to be inspired by, in 2000, St. John Paul II proclaimed him the patron saint of statesmen and politicians. St. Thomas More's life serves not only as a source of inspiration for Catholic politicians, but also for, and I quote, a political system which has its supreme goal, the service of the human person. Erasmus, the humanist and theologian. At the same time that Henry VIII was busy stirring up trouble in England against Catholics loyal to the Pope, there was another Catholic, Martin Luther, living in Germany, who also was resisting papal authority. We will cover the former Augustinian friar and Catholic priest Martin Luther and the reasons why he chose to break from the Catholic Church in a later lecture. In this section, though, you will be introduced to another Catholic priest, Erasmus, who, although at times discouraged by papal corruption, nonetheless remained within the Catholic Church and was obedient to the Pope. According to Erasmus, Luther and his supporters were being hypocritical, since the vices that the Protestant reforms condemned in the Catholic Church were also present in their own communities. And I want to read a little excerpt from Erasmus on the Protestant reformers. You declaim bitterly against the luxury of priests, the ambition of bishops, the tyranny of the Roman pontiff, and the babbling of the sophists, against our prayers, fasts, and masses, and you are not content to retrench the abuses that may be in these things, but needs abolish them entirely nothing, in short, that is generally receives, pleases you. But you must needs pluck up the wheat with the tares, or rather the wheat instead of the tares. And what in the meantime do you offer us better or more worthy of the gospel, to make us quit our ancient practices? Look around on this evangelical generation, and observe whether amongst them less indulgence is given to luxury, lust, or avarice, than amongst those whom you so detest. Show me any one person who, by that gospel, has been reclaimed from drunkenness to sobriety, from purity, from fury and passion to meekness, from avarice to liberality, from reviling to well-speaking, from wantonness to modesty. I will show you a great many who have become worse through following it. The solemn prayers of the church are abolished, but now there are very many who never pray at all. I have never entered their conventicles, but I have sometimes seen them returning from their sermons, the countenances of all of them displaying rage and wonderful ferocity as though they are animated by the evil spirit. Influential Renaissance Artists Cimabue As mentioned in the previous lecture, Cimabue was a Florentine painter and maker of mosaics. He broke from the Italian byzantine style, but not completely. According to the Italian historian Vasari, Cimabue taught Giotto. Giotto di Bondone. Giotto also was a Florentine painter. He broke almost completely from the Italo Byzantine style by painting according to nature or as the eye sees its subjects. The two paintings below in your transcript naturally depict grief. In the first painting, Christ's disciples and angels are in mourning. And in the second, the followers of St. Francis of Assisi are mourning their masters passing from this world. Blessed Fra Angelico Blessed Fra Angelico was a Dominican of Florence's San Marco Friary. There he painted the friary's walls, paying special attention to the cells. 
He was beatified in 1982 by St. John Paul II the Great. Masaccio. Masaccio was an Italian Renaissance artist, among others, who not only painted in a naturalistic style, but also used linear perspective complete with a vanishing point. Michelangelo. Michelangelo uh, is well known for his Pietà in St. Peter's Basilica, the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, and his David in Florence. This Italian Renaissance artist was multi-talented as a painter, sculptor, and poet, and even as an architect. He was responsible for designing St. Peter's Basilica. Raphael. A contemporary of Michelangelo, Raphael was also a leading Renaissance painter and architect of his times. One of his most famous works is the School of Athens, which depicts Aristotle pointing straight ahead in accordance with his moderate balance between the material world and spiritual world, while Plato insists pointing straight up to the realm of ideas. Leonardo da Vinci Leonardo da Vinci was even more of a polymath than any than either of the other two Renaissance masters. He not only was a painter, sculptor, and architect, but was also a philosopher, mathematician, engineer, map maker, anatomist, geologist, and writer. Some of his most famous works include The Moderately Smiling Mona Lisa, The Last Supper, and The Annunciation. Sandro Botticelli and Titian. The Florence artist Botticelli, whose patron was Lorenzo de' Medici, represents and Renaissance artists who painted many scenes from Greek and Roman myths. One of his most famous works is The Birth of the Roman Goddess Venus, or Aphrodite, in Greek. Another famous painting of his is Primavera, and it is likewise centered on the goddess Venus. Bernini The Italian artist and architect Bernini is considered by some as Michelangelo's successor. Bernini designed the Piazza San Pietro in front of St. Peter's Basilica. In accordance with the image of the Catholic Church being a holy mother, the placement of the pillars surrounding the piazza resembles arms of a mother ready to embrace her children. Another famous work by Bernini is Apollo and Daphne sculpture. According to a myth described by Ovid in his Metamorphosis, Daphne, not wanting to be captured by Apollo, has her wish granted and is changed into a tree. Bernini modeled the Apollo figure upon an ancient Roman statue, the Apollo Belvedere. The Apollo Belvedere was rediscovered in Italy during the 15th century. Some art historians speculate that the Apollo Belvedere was in turn a Roman copy in marble of an even more ancient Greek bronze original. The Renaissance Popes The time of the Renaissance papacy can be understood as beginning when the Western Papal Schism ended. In review, during the time of the Western Papal Schism, two popes and at one time three popes claimed to be legitimate. The Ecumenical Council of Constance finally brought an end to the schism that had divided Catholic countries and even recognized saints over who was the valid pope. After two claimants of the papacy resigned, the third, the Avignon-based anti-pope, was excommunicated. Once these events occurred, the Council of Constance elected Martin V as the legitimate pope. Both during the time of the Western Papal Schism and during the time of the Avignon Papacy, which had laid the groundwork for the schism, the city of Rome, the city of St. Peter's, and Paul's heroic martyrdom and witness to the faith had been neglected. Aware of the need to build up the city of Rome, Martin V and subsequent Renaissance popes spent much time and financial resources in beautifying Rome. Under the great patron of the arts, Pope Leo X, renovation of St. Peter's Basilica continued. This was in the early 1500s. Raphael decorated many papal rooms and, literature, and literatures, poetry, and antiquities were promoted. Pope Clement VII also helped to build up the spiritual authority of the Church by refusing to grant Henry VIII's insufficiently grounded request for an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and by excommunicating him when Henry VIII insisted on divorcing his wife and marrying Anne Boleyn. 
Henry VIII responded in anger by issuing the 1534 Supremacy Act, when he where he declared he was the head of the Church of England and not the Pope. Despite the Renaissance Pope's positive features of beautifying Rome and remaining true to the teachings of the Church, as aided by the Holy Spirit, not even one of the Renaissance popes have been canonized or in the process of being even considered for canonization, and the lives of many of them were far from exemplary. Nepotism, promoting one's nephews to high ecclesiastical offices, and the breaking of the vow of chastity by taking mistresses were but a few of the papal vices prevalent during this time. In describing a few ex examples of Renaissance papal Vice, Eamon Duffy, an Irish Catholic historian and former Pontifical Historical member of the Pontifical Historical Commission, writes the following. Alexander VI, and I quote from him directly, flaunted a young nubile mistress in the Vatican, was widely believed to have made a habit of poisoning his cardinals so as to get his hand on their property, and ruthlessly aggrandized his illeg illegitimate sons and daughters at the church's expense. Julius II, inspired patron of, of Raphael, Bramante, Michelangelo, and Leonardo, was a very dubious father of all the faithful, for he had fathered three daughters of his own while a cardinal, and he was a ferocious and enthusiastic warrior, dressing in silver papal armor and leading his own troops through the breaches blown in the city walls of towns who resisted his authority. Leo X, son of Lorenzo, the Magnificent of Florence, was made a cleric at seven and a cardinal at thirteen years old. As pope, he ruled both Rome and Florence. He was the pope whose indulgence issued to fund the rebuilding of St. Peter's, led Luther to publish his 95 theses. And so, precipitated the Reformation. At his death, Leo left the church divided and the papacy close to bankruptcy. End of quote. Renaissance Monarchies one final way in this lecture that will help us to understand the Renaissance is by focusing our attention on a few of the notable monarchs of this age. We will begin with the tension between the French and English monarchies before turning our attention to Spain. Catholic England and Catholic France become nation states. From around 1337 to 1453, England and France were engaged in a series of wars that have been called the Hundred Years' War, even though these wars lasted longer than a hundred years. This war can be understood as representing a gradual end of the feudal era with its complicated and overlapping allegiances and the beginning of the simpler centralized nation state. In 1066, England fell under the French feudal structure when the French Norman king, William the Conqueror, invaded their lands. During the Battle of Hastings of 1066, Willem the Conqueror decisively defeated the English. Consequently, the English people became a vassal to the French overlords. As time went on, England began turning the tables of power so much that they became poised to become the overlords of the French. During the famous Battle of Agincourt in northern France, the English king Henry V defeated the French and as a result began to rule most of northern France. This infuriated the French so much that they fought back. One renowned heroine and saint who led French in battle against the English was Saint Joan of Arc. In 1429, she persuaded Charles VII, who many French people considered to be their French king, to fight the English king, Henry VI, who claimed to be the French king. Saint Joan of Arc, as mentioned previously, was burned at the stake in 1431 after she was captured by the Burgundians and tried as a witch in an ecclesiastical court in favor of the English. Although St. Joan of Arc was tried by an ecclesiastical court, the court was controlled by the English court crown, and hence its outcome was politically determined. St. Joan's vision of a free France, though, paid off, and in the 1453 Battle of Castignon, France successfully regained its lands taken by the English. France's numerous battles with England led the French people to want a centralized state ruled by a strong monarch who would secure them from English aggression. This meant, though, that French feudal lords, with their numerous 
fiefdoms, power needed to be weakened, and so they were under the French king Louis XI. Spain becomes a Catholic nation-state. After the Visigothic king of Hispania, Ricared I, converted from Arianism to Catholicism in 589, the local Third Council of Toledo was held that same year. The council condemned Arianism and adopted Catholicism as the official religion of Hispania. Catholic rule of Spanish lands, though, was not to last long. In 712, Islamic forces defeated Catholic forces in the Battle of Guadaleta. Muslim rule lasted all the way up to 1492, when Queen Isabella I and King Ferdinand II retook Spain from Muslim rule in what is now known as the Spanish Reconquista. The year 1492 is chosen as the date when Catholics once again ruled over Spain, since during that year the last Islamic stronghold of the Nazarid Kingdom of Granada fell to the Catholics. After the Battle of Granada, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand intensified their efforts in building up a state that was bound together as a nation in part by Catholicism. They also built up national identity by instituting a monopoly on mints. Prior to their reign, Henry IV of the Kingdom of Castile, ruled from 1454 to 1474, had multiplied mints to around 150 by drastically reducing the number of mints. Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand shrewdly unified their country economically and not only religiously. God bless.